A dazzling cache of jewelry vanishes into thin air. That was a huge heist. Millions of dollars in jewels. A mystery woman, a cop turned robber, and a flawless crime. The level of professionalism, I think, would make the best cat burglar in the world envious. It was the greatest unsolved robbery in the Midwest. The police had no idea who did it. It was a perfect job. August 1994, Columbus, Ohio. Hundreds of jewelry salesmen arrive at the Hyatt Regency Hotel for the biggest jewelry convention in the Midwest. Checking in with them, millions of dollars in gold, silver, diamonds, and gems. A, a jewelry convention is uh, when jewelers come to a particular town, usually it's Chicago, New York, Las Vegas, and display their wares. Watches, jewels of all kinds, display cases, jewels uh, filling boxes and boxes and boxes. Andy Zane was among the salesmen arriving. I was uh, attending that show um, that August uh, as a buyer for my company. For jewelry salesmen, their wares are their livelihoods. Safekeeping is essential. The jewelers would carry their jewels with them at all times, never leave them out of their sight, check them into the hotel, and many of them would store their jewels in the safe. I decided just to take, as a safety precaution not to keep anything in my room with me. So I went down to the front desk and signed up for a safety deposit box. Uh, put my goods in there, which were some loose stones, some cash, uh, I think my watch. So I fit everything into it and locked it up. Just as hotel reception was closing for the night, there was a late arrival. She, too, asked to stow her goods in one of the safety deposit boxes before retiring to her room. Andy Zane and the other salesmen went to bed satisfied that their valuables were safely locked up behind reinforced steel. The next morning, nothing could have prepared them for what they found. I got up. Um, I wanted to get uh, an, early, an early start. I went down, got my box. I opened it, and uh, it was empty. And it wasn't just Andy Zane's jewels that were gone. The other salesmen were waking up to the same terrible shock. They were dumbfounded. Millions of dollars in jewels. Cleaned out every, every what safety deposit box in the hotel. That was a huge heist. It was a perfect job. The police were just as baffled as everyone else. An estimated million and a half dollars worth of jewels had been stolen. The salesman's worst nightmare had come true. I had total disbelief, complete shock. Um, you know, I felt very victimized. Uh, yeah, my stomach started to feel very sick because I realized, you know, this was a large sum of money to me at the time. I lost approximately $14,000. The most perplexing thing of all was that there was no sign of a break-in. Both the salesman and the hotel staff still had their safe keys, and none of the boxes had been forced open. I really felt initially that this was an inside job. In fact, I remember accusing the hotel of that, saying, you know, how else could this have happened? The police scheduled interviews with every single person who stayed in the hotel that night. But there was one guest they couldn't find. The mysterious lady who checked in late had completely disappeared. Could she be the mastermind behind the million dollar jewel heist? It was an extraordinary heist at a jewelry convention in Columbus, Ohio. $1.5 million in goods had vanished from safety deposit boxes at the Hyatt Regency. Police had no evidence and no eyewitnesses. They were sure it was an inside job. 
They didn't have the slightest inkling that the mastermind was really one of their own. The legendary ex-chief of Chicago police, William Hanhart. Hanhart was probably uh, the greatest cop Chicago ever had. He, he cleared out more crime, caught more thieves, put more guys behind bars than uh, probably any other policeman in Chicago. He was a well-decorated Chicago policeman. William Hanhart's career spanned 33 years, the best and the worst of Chicago police history. He quickly established an early reputation as a reliable, tough, sharp street cop working the streets of Chicago. You have to understand, when he'd come into a police um, station, the young officers would look at him as a rock star. You know why? Because he could pick and choose which ones would become detective and who would have the right assignment. In the 60s and 70s, the city's mafia, known as the Outfit, was easily the most powerful force in Chicago. Police officers often found themselves forced into playing ball with the other side. Hanhart was no exception. Uh, Hanhart was mobbed up from the moment he stepped on the police force. And he was elevated, given prominence by uh, corrupt regimes. Here's this fellow who was the outfit's cop, sanctioned by the outfit, a master criminal mind working as a master detective. During Hanhart's career, jewelry thefts plagued Chicago, and the top cop was usually the one to crack the cases. After a glittering 33-year service, Hanhart retired to the suburbs, taking with him a wealth of knowledge. You know, when you're a cop and your specialty is uh, big jewelry scores, over the years you get to know the salesmen, the conventions, uh, the bad guys, the good guys, and you get to know what jewelry salesmen do. In retirement, Bill Hanhart saw that there were fortunes to be mined from his knowledge of jewel heists. With solid connections on both sides of the law, the opportunity was too tempting to pass up. Jewelry salesmen became Hanhart's prey, and he called on his old gangster friends for help. Hanhart put together a gang that the, uh, the roots of which trace back far, in, far back into his career. These people were not simply smash and grab, shoot them up type guys. They were very cold and calculating. They would watch and wait. And they had information given to them by the Chicago Police Department. And that's how he followed the jewelry salesmen across the country. Hanhart's main men were Joseph Pazinski and Sam DeStefano. He also had friends in the police force who helped his operations run smoothly. When a license plate had to be run or something had to be done, uh, he would call some of his old friends on the police department and say, hey, can you run a license plate? Can you, can you check this for me? Can you see where this guy is staying? Uh, his old friends had no way of knowing, you know, what he was doing, so they did it for him. As chief of detectives, he put all these detectives, thousands of them, in, into their jobs. So they owed him. Hanhart and his gang perfected the art of separating jewelry salesmen from their jewels. They were very careful of how they did it. They would do extensive research. They would find out what cars they drove their personal habits. Could they drink a lot of coffee and drive, or would they have to make frequent stops? They scrutinized the salesman's patterns of behavior so well that the gang even knew when and where each one would stop to use the bathroom. This was one of their prime opportunities to pounce. A gang member would quickly seize the jewel-filled car, and the crime would be executed in the time it took to visit the restroom. Sometimes they used uh, different suitcases. They would substitute empty suitcases for um, that which they removed. The level of professionalism, I think, would make the best cat burglar in the world envious. And so it went for nearly 10 years. With Chicago's cops and robbers working for them, the gang seemed untouchable. They had, they had a good time. They were rolling, they had money, they had the fences. 
He had all the connections with the outfit and, on the, and with the coppers. But Hanhart wanted more. Chasing individual jewelry salesmen around the Midwest didn't seem like the most efficient way to fleece them. There had to be a time when they all came together, in one place, at one time, with all their jewels. Hanhart targeted the biggest jewelry convention in the region. He found out when and where it was happening and came up with a simple yet brilliant plan. After years of surveillance, Hanhart knew exactly where the salesmen would be storing their jewels. Despite high security vaults being available at the convention center, experience told them they'd opt for the convenience of a hotel safety deposit box. So once he found out which hotel they'd be staying in, he could start putting his plan into action. This was an elaborate, elaborate job that was scoped out long in advance. Over the space of a year, Joseph Pazinski became a regular visitor at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. He would check in under the name Mr. Gold and would always ask for a safety deposit box. Every time Bazinski checked in, the hotel would allocate him a different box. And each time, he cut himself a copy of the key. They had duplicated keys through uh, the process of registering in this hotel until they had an entire menagerie of keys for all of the boxes. On the night of August 14, 1994, the jewelry salesmen started arriving at the Hyatt. One by one, the safety deposit boxes filled up with jewels. Enter Mrs. Gold, the mysterious accomplice, all the keys to the treasure trove in her possession. Her task was simple, check in, request a deposit box, and open Sesame. One and a half million dollars worth of jewels was quickly transferred into her case. The heist was complete. Exit Mrs. Gold. The theft of the gems at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Columbus was their biggest score, worth $1.5 million. Hanhart had every movement planned down to the very minute detail. This was the genius of the gang. It would have been the perfect crime, like a beautifully executed conjuring trick. Hanhart had made the jewels vanish. But the huge heist became a hot topic. And in a dog-eat-dog -dog town like Chicago, the question was, how long could this mastermind's secret be safe? Ex-Chicago police chief William Hanhart and his gang had pulled off the most infamous heist in the Midwest, stealing $1.5 million in jewelry from the Hyatt Regency Hotel. Hanhart was no stranger to jewel theft, but this was his finest hour. Investigators' only lead was the disappearance of a hotel guest named Mrs. Gold, the last person to have entered the Hyatt safe room. But according to all records, she simply didn't exist. With no witnesses, clues, or evidence, the gang seemed invincible. The police had no idea who did it, and they wouldn't have been looking at Hanhart at least officially. He was their boss. He was, he, was, he was the guy with the juice. Sure, he had left the department, but the detectives who handle jewel thefts were his guys. But after 10 years as a successful criminal, Hanhart's luck was beginning to run out. His gang may once have been thick as thieves, but Chicago was a jungle, and ultimately, each man was out for himself. When you are a police officer or you have an image or reputation, you really shouldn't be committing crimes with guys that are bust outs or losers, because it's inevitable. As soon as these, one of these little fish gets caught, they're going to turn over on a big fish, because the government, uh, you know, looking for big fish, they don't want little fish. Police were arresting small-time crooks and trying to bargain with them. To reduce their sentences, the criminals were spilling the beans on others, including Hanhart and his gang. So the FBI decided to listen in. Wiretaps were placed on Hanhart's phone at his private residence in Deerfield. 
And this had been going on unbeknownst to Hanhart. The FBI pursued Hanhart with the same dogged determination he'd shown in his years as a cop. By 1996, 10 years after he'd retired and two years after the big heist, the government was finally onto him. Hanhart should have known to keep a low profile, but he was so sure of himself, he got complacent. Here you got a, a, a decorated policeman who's been listening to wiretaps all his life, and he knows how deadly they are. He knows wiretaps are what put people in jail the rest of their lives. And what does he do? Talk on a telephone. The police traced the many calls Hanhart made to his old colleagues in the Chicago PD. They found out he'd been keeping tabs on jewelry salesmen. Over months of surveillance, the evidence against Hanhart was mounting. But detectives' big breakthrough came from an unlikely source. I think the mistake uh, Hanhart made was he shouldn't be rolling around with the little fish because one of the guy was fighting with his wife and giving her all kinds of grief. And it's inevitable. It's just a matter of time before somebody rolls over. And that's what happened. Hanhart gang member Sam DeStefano was having problems in his personal life. Sam DeStefano was a mob guy in Chicago, going through a bad divorce uh, with his wife Karen DeStefano. Uh, I represented his wife Karen, but I told Sam right up front when I served him, you know, you got a name in Chicago, eyes are going to open when they see you in court. If I was you, let this thing go away. But apparently he decided to fight it. And that's how it all started. Karen was fighting for her fair share of a divorce settlement. She wanted some jewelry that Sam had given her as a gift. Sam said no. The jewels were from the Hyatt Hotel heist. Handing them over meant opening Pandora's box. He had a safe deposit box. In that safe deposit box was some stolen jewelry, fictitious driver's license, telephone and car bug information, and he had it in his wife's name. Two things you should never do, put things in a safe deposit box and put it in your wife's name. That's his big mistakes. So he went through a divorce and he wanted what was in the box. Sam DeStefano refused to give in to his wife's demands. In all his careful planning, Hanhart hadn't factored in a scorned woman. One day, Sam pushed Karen over the line. Finally, when he aggravated her by bringing his girlfriend to court, flaunting her in front of his wife, uh, and the FBI says, come and talk to us. She talked to the FBI. Pandora's box was open, and the game was up. Karen testified about the entire gang's involvement in the Hyatt Regency heist. The contents of the box confirmed her story. The Hanhart gang's 10-year run was over. On October 18, 2001, William Hanhart was arrested by the very police department he once ran. Then, Hanhart surprised everyone. A handful of sleeping pills nearly ended his life. To hear of his attempt to commit suicide uh, prior to his sentencing hearing, I think was the greater shock in the city of Chicago. Was it weakness? or cunning. Prosecutors believe that Hanhart's suicide attempt was a shrewd plan to delay the criminal justice system. But perhaps he just couldn't face being caught. To spend the rest of your days, or what are likely to be the rest of your days, in a federal penitentiary is a daunting prospect. The incriminating evidence in the safety deposit box linked Hanhart's entire gang to the Hyatt heist. Joseph Bozinski was sentenced to nine years in jail. Sam DeStefano got five. To this day, the true identity of Mrs. Gold has never been revealed. In 2002, William Hanhard was sentenced to 15 years and 18 months behind bars, where he still is today. If you look back in history, of all the big giants who have fallen, it was always because of one little Mickey Mouse thing that they, they overlook. A telephone conversation, teaming up with the wrong guy, a bad divorce, something always brings down giants and that's what happened here.
the tale of William Hanhart and his gang has become one of Chicago's modern day legends. I always wanted to have a drink with him. I mean, I wonder if someday before he dies, if he'd really sit down and tell the truth about his life, because that would be fascinating.